It's Texaco time with Fred Allen. Welcome to the Texaco Star Theater, ladies and gentlemen, and a special welcome to our armed forces all over the world who will hear this program by short wave. Tonight we present Fred Allen, Kenny Baker, Portland Hoffa, our special guest, Miss Jean Arthur from Hollywood, the winner of the Texaco College competition, Claude Coleman from St. Louis University of St. Louis, Missouri, and Al Goodman's Orchestra. An hour of mirth and melody brought to you by Texaco dealers from coast to coast. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the July issue of True Detective magazine contains Fred Allen's favorite crime thriller. We now present this famous crime authority, ready to solve the mystery of who's going to kill the next 60 minutes. Fred Allen in first. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, I wouldn't bother reporting, ladies and gentlemen. It's too hard for that. Just nod to me and I'll understand. <laughs> And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And Mr. Wallington, I would suggest, uh, if you don't mind, that you read my favorite uh, mystery and true detective this month. As a boy, as a little boy, did you ever hear that verse? Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 whacks. <laughs> That's uh, what it is. That's I'm it. not interested in the Lizzie Borden case, Mr. Allen. There's only one crime that burns me up. One crime? What is that, James? The great Jimmy Wallington crime. Oh, the great? <laughs> <laughs> the great crime. Uh, the, the Wallington crime, you mean? That's right. <laughs> that is that it's a crime that you don't let Wallington do something on this program. Yeah. I'm getting sick and tired of standing around here week after week doing nothing. Why don't you get on the Benny show? He's doing nothing all stuff. <laughs> Probably need a straight man to do nothing, to hold him up to do nothing or something. You'll uh, you'll have company, Jimmy. Well, you can't knock Jack Benny to me. At least he lets Don Wilson show his talent on the program. Oh, Don Wilson, that gristle with a hat on. Don. Boy, I'd like to get a chance at a microphone alone like Don Wilson does. What would you do? I'd show you what I'd do, believe you me. All right, Mr. Wallington, you say you have talent. You say that I'm holding you back. Now, here is your, your big opportunity. The microphone is yours. Now, what is it you want to do? Thank you very much, Mr. Wallington. Mr. Wallington's records will be on sale in the lobby. And now that Mr. <laughs> now that Mr. Wallington's hidden talent has been brought out into the open where the air can get at it, we in Toto, which won't hurt it any, we turn to the latest news of the week. The March of Trivia presents its weekly lowlight from the world of news. Washington, D.C. War Production Board announces order which will stop production of practically all metal musical instruments in the immediate future. Shortage of metal instruments causes consternation in musical circles. A musician from New Jersey says... 10,000 guys are hoping they take my instrument away from me. 10,000? Yeah, I'm the bugler at Fort Mammoth. <laughs> well, what will happen if you uh, don't blow your bugle some morning? Brother, you will hear snoring as far west as Toledo. <laughs> and now the March of Trivia interviews several musicians who have been affected by the shortage of the metal instruments. First, a popular band leader... What is the name of your group, sir? Solid Sam and his seven senders. Uh, <laughs> Solid Sam? Yeah, it's a gut bucket combo. Oh, <laughs> oh I see. Yeah, our specialty is Barrel House. Sometimes we break it down during a jam joust and schmaltz it up till our chops is beat. <laughs> you haven't an interpreter with you by any <laughs> Well, say, you uh, you fellas must have a, have a hot outfit. Well, you can't dance closer than ten feet to the band. It's not closer than ten feet? Why not? We'll cremate you. Uh, <laughs> you're, uh, you're that hot, huh? If you dance your girl too close, you're apt to end up going home with a clinker. Uh, <laughs> that has happened to me already. Uh, <laughs> Well, how are you How are you coping with the metal instrument shortage, Sam? That's nothing. I just threw out all the brasses and put in violin. 
Sam and his solid senders is set for the duration. Well, now what if there is a shortage later, a shortage of violin bows? Well, I can make my own bows. You can get horsehair? I got a guy at Belmont saving this for me. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah, when jockeys ain't looking, he pulls horses' tails and saves me the hair. <laughs> I'm sitting pretty for bows. Well, what about violin strings? Yeah, them I don't worry about. I got plenty of potential strings. Potential violin strings? I got 200 cats down in my cellar. <laughs> well, that takes the kitty, and thank you, Solid Sam. I hate that when they start their own applause as they're leaving the microphone. Anything I... Like... A victim of... A victim... A victim of the instrument ban is... Uh, I'm sorry, uh, miss. Your name has slipped my mind, too. I, I am Madame Olga, my child. Oh, Madame Olga. Oh, I see you here. You traffic with spirit. You uh, prowl the occult. You prowl... Madame the... Olga is a medium. Oh, I see Seances on the hour from 9 to 5, or by appointment. Oh. Well, now, what about this musical instrument shortage, Madame Olga? Thanks to the WPB, my studio is a shambles. Some client broke up your place? My crystal ball is in pieces. My Ouija board is in splinter. It is, huh? What, uh... <laughs> what, uh, what happened? Friday night, I received a call from the head of the musicians' union. Local 802? Yes. Uh-huh. The head of the union wanted me to summon Gabriel from the grave beyond. <laughs> he had a warning. A warning for Gabriel? Yes. When Gabriel comes, he can't blow his trumpet here in New York until he joins the musicians' union. <laughs> Say, that's after whole things up, don't you think? Yes. Uh-huh. Well, I opened my seance. Yeah? I said, Aging Gabriel. Aging Gabriel, yeah. There was a dank switch of ectoplasm. It was Gabriel. Yeah? <laughs> I said, Gabriel, sound your trumpet. Well, what happened? Gabriel must have heard of the metal instrument shortage. He didn't blow his trumpet? Gabriel blew a sweet potato. <laughs> Well, a yam session is the thing in swing, and thank you, Madam Olga. And now a symphony musician who is greatly upset, apparently is greatly upset, Otto Sussman. Why, uh, you're trembling, Mr. Sussman. Yeah, Sussman is ruined. What, uh, what happened? I am playing with the symphony fourth cornet. Fourth cornet you play, huh? Yeah, it's coming priorities. I am pooling my cornet. You are pooling your cornet. Yeah, huh? when the symphony is playing, the sun is using the cornet. I see. And nights when you are not playing, you let some other musician play your cornet. It is fated. Or oh, something went wrong? Thursday night, I am pooling. Who is taking this month's cornet? Who? Hotlick Shapiro. <laughs> He is with Glenn Miller playing. That is fate. Well, how, how come, Mr. Sussman? The next night, Hartlick Shapiro is returning the cornet. Sussman is playing symphony. I see. The music is playing. La da, da 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 da. Yes. Sussman on the cornet is playing. Just those two notes. Yeah, huh? the symphony is going. La da 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 da. Uh huh. Sussman is blowing. Well, what uh, what happened at the concert? Hotlick Shapiro is not shaking out the cornet. And? Inside the cornet is sticking one hot lick left over. One? <laughs> one hot lick? Poor Swiss man. Well, what? The uh, music is going... And you? Swiss man is blowing. What happened? Sussman is with Carnegie Hall no longer. <laughs> Where are you playing now? Sussman is solo at the Duffy's Tavern. <laughs> well, your, your nose tells me there is one bar in Duffy's Tavern you are playing, and thank you, Otto Sussman. Well, I guess that takes care of... By the wee old droopy jowl, false staffs here, they'll soon be howled. <laughs> now, look, Mr. Openshaw, I... The Alley Addison is at your service. Now, not with more of those rancid rondos, I trust. Have you heard, said the skate to the bait, you'll have to wait? <laughs> no, I don't think I have. 
I took her into the SHA and tried to get her alone. No, I haven't heard of that one either. Mother knew she was getting the policeman's goat when she saw him reach for his billy. Now, wait. Look, tonight... Tonight, <laughs> tonight we happen to be talking about the ban on musical instruments. Precisely why I am here. I have written a poem. What is your music poem called? Strike Up the Ban. Strike up the band, huh? Well, how does it go? This WPB order is just the thing. It definitely spells the doom of swing and those off-key bands with their raucous brasses and the jitterbug gates with their hepcat lasses. I hope they stop making saxophones, clarinets, banjos, and slide trombones, oboes and fife and euphonium, piccolos, guitars, and big bass drums. Don't get me wrong, I like swing bands. I'm nuts about music of certain brands. It's just one of them things, them paradoxes. Bands ruin my business. I sell jukeboxes. Nickel, 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 nickel. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul Staff Openshaw. And as Paul Staff shuffles away, we turn to welcome Kenny Baker. Now, for his first number tonight, Kenny has chosen a song from Maytime, Will You Remember? Al Goodman conducting, Kenny.
Goodman has just given us a synopsis of three little sisters. We just had time to meet one of the girls. And that brings us to... Uh, Mr. Allen! Portland! <laughs> Say, what's wrong, Portland? You, uh, you look scared to death. There's a lady outside with three snakes. She wants to see you. A lady with three snakes? She says the snake played on the bill with you at Ithaca. Snakes on the bill at Ithaca? Has the woman got venom spots on her sleeves and fang bites all over her face? Yes. Rosita and her rattlers. <laughs> Ever since Jack Haley and Ben Burney were here telling me that Vaudeville was back, hundreds of old acts have been coming around to see me here. They're calling you the Daniel Boone of Vaudeville. I know, I heard that, the Daniel Boone, yet. Yeah. Life magazine has pictures of Haley and me dancing in this week's issue. My apartment house lobby looks as though Ringling Brothers is casting there. Clowns, midgets, sawdust, so <laughs> people are... There was a magician looking for you before. Well, how do you know he was a magician? I saw rabbit tracks in his hat. Rabbit tracks in his hat. <laughs> you know, it's terrible. I got up this morning and there was a contortionist under my bed. Of all... Uh, oh, will you answer the phone, Portland, please? All right. <laughs> Hello? Yes. Who is it? Another Vaudeville act? Yes, it's Armbuster and his talking dog. You can have the act for $50 a week. Tell him no. Hello? Mr. Allen says... Oh, what? Yes, I'll tell him. Goodbye. Well, now what? You can have the dog alone for 25. Well, what is Armbuster going to do? I don't know. Well, wasn't that Armbuster talking on the phone? No, that was the dog. <laughs> Dog's calling me up yet. If I, uh, if I, if I, how did the dog get a nickel in the phone to call up? <laughs> Oh, hello, Kenny. I didn't see you coming. Hi, Effie. Hello, Porty. Hello, Kenny. Is that your traveling bag? Yes, Porty. I just dropped in to say goodbye. Goodbye? Where do you think you're off to? I'm going into Vaudeville, F.A. I open in New Britain Wednesday. Open in New Britain? <laughs> <laughs> Have you been talking to those broken-down small-timers who've been pesting me around here? I've had plenty of offers, brother. Offers? For Porter? What offers? I could have gone with Neil and his seal. <laughs> the honey boy minstrels were after me. They wanted me to sing with black on my face. No kidding. Which offer did you take, Kenny? I'm going with the novelty Peabody's. They're short a man. The novelty Peabody's? What kind of an act is it, Kenny? Well, when the curtain goes up, the four Peabody's are standing there in pink tights. Bloodshot pal brigands, huh? <laughs> Two Peabody's pick up a big slab of concrete and put it on the other Peabody's head. Yeah. Then the fourth Peabody hits a slab of concrete with a sledgehammer and it breaks. The house comes down. Which Peabody would you be, Kenny? The one with the concrete on his head. Who else? <laughs> what happened to the other Peabody? From getting hit on the head with a sledgehammer five shows a day, yeah. he's got fallen arches. Fallen arches. <laughs> He got them the hard way, huh? Well, Kenny, getting hit on the head with that sledgehammer, you're apt to get hurt. What can happen? I got fallen arches already. Oh, I give up. I give up. Portland. Yes? You keep an eye on the door. Now, if any vaudeville acts show up, you keep them out. I've got to introduce our guest. Who's coming tonight? Well, Jean Arthur called me up a little while ago. She said she wanted to see me, that it was uh, very important. So I invited her over, naturally. Jean Arthur, the movie star? Yes, Portland, and uh, you may have heard someplace that uh, three is a crowd. <laughs> I get it. Uh-huh. And now, ladies and gentlemen, may I present one of the cinema's most charming ladies, Miss Jean Arthur. I'm happy to see you, Jean. I'm happy to see you, too, Fred. What I've been through the last two weeks with those vaudeville actors. You know, it's a pleasure to see someone from Hollywood. Oh, thank you. For one night, I won't have to worry about vaudeville, Jean. Say, you said that you wanted to talk to me. What's, uh, what's on your mind? I'm going into vaudeville. Uh... <laughs> oh, now, wait a minute. Jean, you're not through out in Hollywood. They haven't cast you aside like an old sarong, have they, out there? No, no, I just finished a picture at Columbia. A short? No, it's a big feature called The Town's Talking. Uh -huh. Cary Grant and Ronald Coleman are in it. Cary Grant, well, why is it when all of you stars make a picture, the minute it's finished, you come east? 
Now, why don't you stay in Hollywood until the picture comes out and face it? <laughs> but I'm not running away. You're not? No. I'm uh, joining a USO unit to tour the Army camp. Oh, good. That's uh, why I want to talk to you. You uh, need a chaperone? <laughs> No, I need a vaudeville act. Well, who told you to come to me? Everybody said, see, Fred Allen, he started the whole thing. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> You've got to help me, Fred. Uh, what will I need to do a vaudeville act? Well, you have to have a song, a dance, and a few gags. Uh, do you sing? No. Do mm, you dance? No. Do you tell jokes? No. Mm -hmm. Well, what uh, what can you do? Mm, just ask. You, uh, just act, huh? Monotonous, isn't it? <laughs> well, now, wait a minute. We have a problem here, Gene. You are going to tour the army camps. You must have something to do. Can you do any card tricks? Mm, no. No card tricks. So how about acrobatics? Oh, I used to be able to kick myself in the back of the head. <laughs> oh, well, you just can't come out on the stage and kick yourself. <laughs> kick yourself in the back of the head for 15 minutes, I mean. Oh, I don't do it anymore. I had to stop it. You had to stop why? I, it was making my forehead protrude. <laughs> well, that's good. You get more of your money's worth at a phrenologist then. Or something. <laughs> well, there's only one... <laughs> There's only one thing you can do, Jean. I'm afraid that you have to tell a joke. You mean um, I have to walk out on the stage and, and tell a joke? Yes. Alone? Yes. Oh, I can't go out on the stage alone. Well, why not? Well, I'll get blamed for everything. <laughs> oh, you mean in Hollywood the blame is shared? Oh, sure. In, in pictures before I act, the, the names flash on the screen. It tells... Who wrote the picture, who directed it, who made the costume? Oh, well, you can tell a joke the same way, Gene. Now, I'll give you the fanfares, all of the announcements and everything. Oh, but how would it sound? I'll show you how it would sound. A fanfare, Mr. Goodman. This joke is presented by the Texaco Style Theater. This joke was written for radio by Nat Hyken. Additional dialogue and joke by Roland Kitty and Arnold Auerbach. This joke is based on an original joke by Mark Twain. <laughs> the joke will be told by Miss Jean Arthur. Miss Arthur's wardrobe created especially for this joke by Bloomingdale Basement. <laughs> Mr. Allen's wardrobe by Barney. <laughs> Between this joke and any other joke you may have heard over your radio is highly probable. This is, is a Fred Allen production. All right, Gene, now that ought to make you feel at home. Now go ahead and tell your joke. Uh, uh, where's the director? Director? Look, I'm from Hollywood. I wouldn't know what to do without a director. Well, we haven't got time to get Lubitsch now, Gene. <laughs> Well, can't you direct me, Fred? Well, all right. I'll try to direct. I've never done it, of course. I tell you, I'll tell the joke first to show you how it goes. Now, this is the joke, in case there's any misunderstanding later. A little boy came running up... <laughs> a little boy. <laughs> well, you don't know of these things. A little boy came running up to his mother on a train and said, Mommy, what was the name of the city we just stopped at? And the mother said, Go away, Rollo. I'm, I'm reading. A few minutes later, the kid ran up again and said, Mommy, what was the name of that city? And the mother said, We have passed the city, Rollo. Why do you want to know the name of it? And the boy said, Because little brother just got off there. <laughs> Do you, you get it? Uh, yes. Um, now I'm supposed to finish the joke? Uh. <laughs> no, the joke, the joke has been consummated, Gene. Maybe if I said, I do it. <laughs> I do it. No, Gene, just tell the joke the way it is. All right. Will you direct me? All right. Now I'll direct you. First, look out at the audience and smile. That's right. Now, that shows them that you're not afraid of them. See, that's very important. Now, uh, look, uh, look uh, out at the audience. Uh, 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 look uh, out at the audience again. Maybe if I read yours, I'd have said a lot. Well, I'm, I'm new at this directing, you see. It upsets me. Yes. Now, great. Uh, look down at your script. Fine. Now, look out at the audience and laugh, you see. You see? Uh, 
That shows them that something funny is coming. They'll be on the watch for it. Now look back at your script again. All right, now start the joke. Uh, I'm sorry, Fred, I can't. Well, why not? I, I'm not in the mood. In pictures, I can't do a scene unless I'm in the mood. Well, all right, then. I guess I'll, I'll get you some mood music. Mr. Goodman, could I borrow three nephews with violins? <laughs> I tell you what we want. We need a little mood music for Miss Arthur. A little mood music, will you please? All right, Jean. Now tell your joke. A little boy came up to his mother on a train and said, Mother, darling, mother, what, what was the name of that city we stopped at? And his mother said, Go away! I hate you! I hate you! Wait, wait a minute. All right, wait a minute. <laughs> Thanks a lot, fellas. That's plenty. Uh, look. look, Jean, we are not trying for the Academy Award tonight. <laughs> you are just telling a simple little joke. Was I too emotional? Emotional? You sounded like Betty Davis at a rotary luncheon. <laughs> Dean, there's only one thing to do if you're going to play the army camps. I'm afraid that I will have to make the trip. I'll have to go with you. Oh, will you really do an act with me? Well, why not? Arthur and Alan, a breath from old Broadway. But, but didn't you promise to do an act with Jack Haley? Oh, so what? With a loose coat, a knife, and Haley's back won't even show. <laughs> Well, you and I will be a sensation. Well, what can we do? Now, let me see. Well, we could do a gay 90s routine. You know, you come out on a stage with a leg of mutton sleeves uh, swinging a parasol, and I sort of saunter by in tan button shoes and peg top pants. Yes, you know, and then what? Swagger by. <laughs> then you, you drop your Kleenex, and I pick it up. <laughs> I tip my boater. We tell a couple of jokes. You remember those old jokes like this? Didn't I see you in Atlantic City? Yes, I was the girl with the board walk. Girl with a <laughs> Right, that'll do for one. Now, here's another. What would I have to give you to get a little kiss? Chloroform. <laughs> and then all we have to do, 18 or 9 of those uh, uh, jokes like that, then we sing one of those old gay 90s songs. But I can't sing. Well, ne neither can I. That's great. Our voices won't conflict. Nothing. <laughs> Say, how about uh, in my merry old mobile? You'll be sorry. Well, uh, well, we'll wait and find out. Let's try in my merry old mobile with one of those old time fast patter choruses. We'll just see how it sounds, Mister Goodman. In my merry old mobile. <laughs> With me, Lucille, in my merry old mobile. Down the road of life we'll fly, bubbling you and I. To the church we'll swiftly steal, then our wedding bells will peal. You can go as far as you like with me in my merry old mobile. Take me up along with you, my darling, do, and we will go up high into a latitude about as near as anybody that has ever reached the sky. We will sail around the lunar planet, making love and hugging every time we can, with nobody in the airplane except the minister, you and I. We will float a little, fly and boat a little, while we wrote a little, tender note a little, subsequently back into the sky and having lots of fun. We'll go up and to the sweetest skies of blue and our ascending, we'll figure out the two, but I'll we can't go down, we'll be as one. You can go as far as you like with me and my marriage. Oh, my Ladies and gentlemen, we have no encore. As a matter of fact, to get that song together, we had Mary Oldsmobile, and the patter was from Come Josephine and My Flying Machine. So you know what an encore might turn out to be Gunga Din with a piccolo player. <laughs> 
And uh, while Miss Arthur, thank you, Miss Arthur, and while Miss Arthur prepares to join the workshop players later in the program, Kenny Baker makes a welcome reappearance. This time to sing for us, Johnny Doughboy Found a Rose in Ireland. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the Texaco Star Theater brings you the most talented undergraduate of a leading institution of higher learning. Tonight, we salute St. Louis University at St. Louis, Missouri, by presenting its most talented students. Chosen by a vote of the undergraduate body, the winner has come to New York as Fred Allen's guest with all expenses paid and a cash award of $200. Now, Freddie, are you ready to introduce our guest? Uh, yes, Larry. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present St. Louis University's most talented undergraduate, meet Claude Common. Claude. Well, congratulations, Claude, and more than welcome to our Texaco campus. Thank you, Mr. Allen. They tell me, have you ever heard our program out there in St. Louis? Yes, I tune in every Sunday night. Well, then, of course, you know the first question I'm going to ask you, Claude. Yes, Mr. Allen. This is my first trip to New York. This is your first trip to New York. <laughs> Fine. Well, I suppose you've been out looking our city over. Well, I tried to find a sightseeing bus today. There didn't seem to be any around. No, the sightseeing buses have been taken off the streets, Claude, to save the rubber in the rubber necking, I understand. <laughs> there, There is a new tour, though, that... I'll wait for you, madam. Did you want to laugh? <laughs> uh, we give that service, Claude. <laughs> you just wave at us and we wait. There are... There is a... <laughs> There is a new tour, uh, though, Claude, a new tour that leads from Times Square. There's a man down there with 30 bicycles, and the tourists ride the bicycles around the city, you see, and the guide goes along on a pogo stick and explains the sight. <laughs> but, uh, well, that takes care of New York, Claude. Now, how would you like to tell us something about your school? Well, St. Louis University was founded by Bishop Louis de Berg in 1818. 
It's the oldest university between the Mississippi and the Pacific Ocean. Uh, well, how did the university start? Did someone open a McGuffey reader and a crowd gathered? How did this... <laughs> no, Mr. Allen, the school started in a one-story stone house near the riverfront. At first, it was called an academy for young gentlemen, uh-huh. and 15 students were enrolled. 15? You mean in 1818, there were only 15 gentlemen in St. Louis? <laughs> I wouldn't know, Mr. Allen. Well, what, uh, what happened to the little stone house and the 15 young gentlemen? Today, the university embraces 17 schools and colleges. We have over 7,000 students enrolled, and there are nearly 800 professors on the teaching staff. Well, say, what, are you, uh, what are you studying at school, Claude? Well, I'm wrestling with law. Well, that's fine, wrestling with law, huh? I know a boy who studied law here in New York. He finished his four-year course in three years sued the college and got his last year's tuition back. <laughs> do, you, uh, do, you, uh, do you participate in athletics out there at school? Well, I don't have time for athletics. I have a job. Oh, you have a job? You're working your way through school? Yes, sir. After school hours, I work in a clothing store. Oh, you do, really? Which store? Is it all right to mention it on the air? Why not? You want to get a raise when you get back. <laughs> what uh, what clothing store is it? Robert Custom Taylor. Why why don't you spell it out like a radio announcer? R O B E R T S. Robert. Like that, you mean? Yeah, that's right. And now that you are a vice president in the Robert <laughs> R. Can you tell us any interesting facts about the school, SLU? Well, a St. Louis University football coach, Eddie Cocum, presented the perfection, the modern version of the forward pass. Uh huh. He perfected the version that we have today, I see. And uh, St. Louis was the first university to own and operate its own radio station, WEW. That was back in 1921. W-E-W. Say, when you become a lawyer, Claude, you can open your own goodwill court on W-E-W out there. I'd rather not be a radio lawyer. Well, you have. No, it is bad. If the case is appealed, you have a rebroadcast at night. <laughs> well, you, uh, you have a fine voice. You can sing in radio, Claude. I don't know. I think I'll wait until I finish school, Mr. Allen. Well, you know what you can do? You can mix your law and your singing, Claude. Now, imagine you open up the Goodwill Court singing Zoot Suit, you see. (laughs) Then you turn around and win the suit, which turns out to be from Roberts the Custom Tailor. (laughs) But I think I'm getting a little mixed up, Claude. Perhaps we'd better have your song. Before I sing, Mr. Allen, I have a gift for you. Yes, Claude. We heard down at school that you do a bit of boxing occasionally. Yes, Claude, I do a little boxing, and I have the lump to prove it. <laughs> the student sent you this boxing robe. We thought it might come in handy. Hey, this is a dandy, Claude. This is the robe. I'll just slip it on for size. It's a little chilly in here. <laughs> this thing on, see how it comes out. Hey, this is <laughs> this is a dandy ro- uh, claw, this robe, uh, uh, and I want to thank you and the students of St. Louis University for your kindness tonight. Now, Claude, what about your song? I'd like to sing Dark Eyes. Dark Eyes, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, St. Louis University's most talented undergraduate, Claude Common, sings for us Dark Eyes. <laughs>
fellow students, the faculty, and the St. Louis University alumni will be as pleased with your performance tonight as we are. And all of us here in the Texaco Star Theater wish you every success in your law career. Now, next week, ladies and gentlemen, we will present the most talented undergraduate of West Virginia, uh, Virginia University in Morgantown, West Virginia. I borrowed the teeth for tonight. I don't know what... <laughs> the most talented undergraduate... Virginia University in Morgantown, West Virginia. After hearing the three finalists over station WCHS in Charlestown, West Virginia, the student body voted. The ballots have just been tabulated, and the winner is Mary Eleanor Mulholland. Congratulations, Mary. We'll have the lamp in the window for you next Sunday night. <laughs> program, ladies and gentlemen, you met Miss Jean Arthur. How many times have you as a picture fan said to yourself, where do movie stars come from? How do they become movie stars? What keeps them in the public eye? Well, tonight, we're going to tell you. The Texaco Workshop Players, starring Miss Jean Arthur, present the cavalcade of a glamour girl. This little gem is called A Star is Born, or The Saga of Mona Bodenfelder. <laughs> Mona Bodenfelder was the most glamorous and exotic Hollywood beauty of her day. Mona was born in a tiny town in Jersey, Upper Ferret Falls. She was the prettiest girl in Upper Ferret Falls. And as a little tyke when Mona walked down Main Street with her raven pigtails bobbing, little boys would yell, Hey, Mona, what's your hurry? I'm not playing post office, Mona. <laughs> Here's to you in the dim out, Mona. <laughs> yes, Mona... Mona was the most popular girl in Upper Ferret Falls. A few years later, when graduation day exercises were held at high school, the teacher said, And now our last class award. The student voted most likely to succeed is Mona Bodenfelder. <laughs> and here is her first box plaque, Mona. Oh, thank you, Miss Boynton. And thank you, class, for voting me the most likely to succeed. Um, and no matter how successful I become in life, to you, my classmates, I will always be uh, just a little old Mona Bowden tell yeah, And now, class, we'll rise. We'll sing our school anthem. One, two. Hail to the Alabama we sing. and smiled on Mona from the start. The day after school closed, she went to work as hostess at Golan Paul's Big Meat Market on Elm Street. <laughs> Mona liked to meet people and always had a smile and a kind word for Mr. Golan Paul's patrons. Customers would say, uh, Mona, how is your cold shoulder today? Oh, fine, Mr. Swan. How's yours? Ha, ha, ha. Mona, your card. <laughs> Did you get your order, Mr. White? Oh, uh, yeah, Mona. Close your Boston bag. Your tongue is hanging out. <laughs> oh, thanks, Mona. <laughs> you back again, Mrs. Lane? Yes, I got halfway home, forgot to take my kidneys. 
<laughs> well, you stay right here. I'll get your kidneys for you. Mona was happy in her little world of meat, and that fall, Golden Paul's Meat Market sponsored a beauty contest. No one was surprised that night at the town hall when Mr. Golden Paul in his shiny new apron stood up and announced, Tonight, the Golden Paul Meat Market Beauty Contest comes to a close. The winner will receive a free trip to Hollywood and ten pounds of chuck rope. <laughs> and the winner, the beauty we will crown Miss Upper Ferret Falls, is Mona Bodenfelder. Mona, here is your ticket to Hollywood. Oh, thank you, Mr. Golden Paul. And here is your ten pounds of chuck roast. <laughs> Miss Upper Spirit Paul. Gosh. All right, man. Whoop her up. The next morning, sitting in the day coach with her ticket and ten pounds of chuck roast, <laughs> Mona wondered what Hollywood had in store for her. The first day she arrived in Hollywood, Mona went to see Mr. L.D. Meyer, head of the mighty Diagram Studio. Mr. Golden Paul had given Mona a letter and a veal cutlet to give to Mr. Meyer. <laughs> As Mona entered the big producer's office, Mr. Meyer looked up from his aspirin bottle and said, Why, you're beautiful. Oh, Mr. Meyer. I'll make you a star in pictures. <gasps> oh, Mr. Meyer. Gad, those raven tresses, those dimples, that when... What is your name, Charmer? Mona Bodenfelder. Mona Bodenfelder. Why, that name is box office. Mona Bodenfelder. Gad, you're a find. Where's my aspirin? Here it is, Mr. Meyer. Oh, thank you. I'll buzz my publicity man. Uh, where's my buzzer? Right here. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, yes, Mr. Meyer. Oh, Katie, I've got a find. Again? This is Lena Golden Paul. Nice. Felder, Mr. Meyer. Uh, don't bother me with the tail, this girl. Uh, okay, you get busy. This girl is a star. Yes, sir. I'll coin a gimmick. Oh, wait a minute. We've used oomph girl and sweater girl, LV. Uh, yes, I got it. Yes, okay, he. What? Mona Bodenfelder, the what girl. Gad, what a brain. The what girl. Yeah. Mona, you got what? Oh, oh, what is what, Mr. Meyer? Uh, yes, Mulcahy, what is what? Oh, uh, don't rush me, L.V. I just made up the word. I'll make up the definition later. So long. Well, now, I've, I'll get my makeup, man. Gad, what's wrong with his buzzer? You're buzzing your aspirin bottle, Mr. Meyer. Oh, Gad, I must have swallowed my buzzer. No. Here it is. Oh, yes. Yes, L.V. <laughs> oh, uh, East Mall, this is Hollywood's new star, Sonia Fodenfelder. It's Mona Bodenfelder, Mr. Meyer. Yes, that's right. Well, East Moore? She's the Veronica Lake type, L.B. Yes, she's beautiful. Uh, what does she lack for pictures? You can see both her eyes, L.B. <laughs> Have you seen Veronica Lake, dearie? Yes, Veronica Lake has only one eye. That's it. We'll comb your hair down over both eyes. <laughs> We'll get you a seeing eye dog. <laughs> Dad, what a novelty. You'll play all your love scenes with Mature and a seeing eye dog. <laughs> Great, L.B., I'll get busy. Dad, a new star. And they said L.B. was slipping. Uh, that reminds me. Uh, can you sing, dance, or act? Uh, no, Mr. Meyer. Well, that's no handicap in pictures. <laughs> you mean that... The studio will teach you to sing, dance, and act. Starting tomorrow, you will report to the studio school. Now study hard. You bet your life I will, Mr. Meyer. Come back to me in six months. You'll be a star. And your golden duffer. And Mona Bodenfelder did study hard. Every morning, Mona reported to her singing teacher, Professor Baker. Take a deep breath, Miss Bodenfelder. Inhale. Yes, sir. Now exhale. Very good. Now we'll try the scale. Mm. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Excellent, Miss Bodenfelder. In six months, I will make you another Andrew sister. <laughs> Which Andrew sister will I be, Professor Baker? The one in the middle. <laughs> afternoon, Mona reported to her dancing teacher, Madame Tobova. First, we were bending down. One, two. <laughs> one, two. One, two. Next, we were kicking up. One, two. One, two. One, two. Pointing the toe at this little darling. <laughs> you think I'll ever become a dancer, Madame Tobova? In six months, I will make you another Becky Grable. <laughs> Every night,
right, Mona took a dramatic lesson with Professor Dimmock. To be an actress, you must cry, child. Give me tears. <laughs> Very good. To be an actress, you must laugh. Give me teeth. <laughs> Excellent. To be a success on the screen, you must master three speeches. What speeches, Professor Dimmock? Let me hear you say, <laughs> Darling. <laughs> Darling. Roscoe, you mean... Roscoe, you mean... This is the end. This is the end. Your diction is perfect. Is that all I have to know, Professor Dillon? Yes, those are the only three lines you will ever get to say in pictures. <laughs> I'll master them, Professor Dillon. Good. In six months, I will make you another Shirley Temple. <laughs> At the end of six months, Mona Bowden felt there was a combination of Shirley Temple, Becky Grable, and the Andrew sister in the middle. Her training completed, Mona reported back to the head of the Mighty Diagram Studios, Mr. L.D. Meyer. As Mona opened the door, Mr. L.D. Meyer looked up and roared. Well, what do you want? Who are you? I'm Mona Bodenfelder, the web girl, Mr. Meyer. You want to get into pictures? Oh, yes, sir. You told me... Here, take this memo. Go to see Mr. Schreiber. Yes, sir. Goodbye. Mona went to see Mr. Schreiber. Mr. Schreiber looked at Mr. Meyer's memo and said... Oh, yes. Go to see Mr. Hussey. Mona saw Mr. Hussey. Mr. Hussey said... Oh, yes. Go to see Miss Carroll. Miss Carroll said... Oh, yes. Go to see Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow said... Go to see Mr. Palazzi. Palazzi said... Take this slip and see Mr. Salvin. Mr. Salvin turned out to be the policeman at the studio gate. <laughs> Handing him the slip, Mona said... Where do I go now, Mr. Salvin? You go home, Miss Borden, This slip is your pass to get out of the studio. Good night. <laughs> and so Mona Bodenfelder, Miss Upper Ferret Falls, the little girl who was voted most likely to succeed, found herself outside of the mighty Diagram Studios, disillusioned and alone. Her chuck roast long since eaten, <laughs> she couldn't return and face Upper Ferret Falls, and so Mona took the first job she could find. Months passed. And then one day in the Brown Derby restaurant, Mona saw the head of the Mighty Diagram Studios, Mr. L.D. Meyer, again. Mona spoke to him. The veal fricassee is very nice today, Mr. Meyer. Uh, no, waitress. I think I'll... Well, Gad, girl, what are you doing working in this calorie cave? I have to live, Mr. Meyer. Why, you're beautiful. Please, Mr. Meyer. Gad, those raven tresses, those dimples, that when. Oh, Mr. Meyer. Why, you should be in pictures. What's your name? Mona Bodenfelder. Come to my office tomorrow morning, ladder golden heifer. I will make you a star. Uh, yes, sir. In the meantime, what's your order? Oh, yes. I'll have number seven. Bicarbonate and uh, lukewarm water. Yes, sir. One uh, producer's lunch. Have it medium Luke. <laughs> Mona Bodenfelder didn't sleep a wink that night. At last, she was to have her chance in pictures. The next morning, bright and early, Mona entered Mr. L.D. Meyer's office. As she opened the door, Mr. L.D. Meyer looked up and roared. Well, what do you want? Uh, I'm Mona Bodenfelder. You want to get into pictures? But you told Here, me... Here, take this memo. Go to see Mr. Schreiber. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, you can go yourself, Mr. L.D. Meyer. I can go where? You know where, and it isn't to see Mr. Schreiber. <laughs> you dare to tell me? Two years ago, you said you'd make me a star. You said me to study singing, dancing, and acting. You said I'd be the WAP girl. WAP girl? I studied six months. When I came back, you didn't even know me. I? You turned me away. I've been working at the Brown Derby yesterday. You told me to come back here. I? Today, you don't know me again. When I left up in Ferret Falls, I had hopes. I had ambitions. Wait a minute, girl. Did you say Upper Ferret Falls? Yes, that's my home. Upper Ferret Falls? I lived there as a boy. So what is your name, girl? Mona Bodenfelder. Bodenfelder. What was your father's name? Ossip. Ossip Bodenfelder, my uncle's cousin. <laughs> Mr. Meyer, you mean... Mona Bodenfelder, you are my own great-grandniece, quite removed. I am. You're a relative. This is the day I've been waiting for. I don't understand. Uncle Elvie. For 20 years, I've been putting relatives on the studio payroll. My brother Irving is the treasurer. My sister's husband is casting director. My wife's uncle is a producer. My grandfather is wardrobe man. My nephew's running the cutting room. The studio is run by relatives? Relatives are everywhere but in my pictures. For 20 years, I've been testing relatives, but I've never found a relative with talent until today. Uncle Elvie, you mean that I... Your great-great-grandmother is twice removed? You, Mona 
a Bodenfeller, or a relative. I will make you a star. Oh, thank you, Elvie. Now I can die happy. For 20 years, I've been looking at relatives around the studio. Now I can finally see a relative on the screen. Gad, I can't wait to see that name in light. A star is born. From now on, you are... Mona Bodenfelder, the Wolf Girl. That, that is how Mona Bodenfelder became a Hollywood star. And the moral is, the quickest way to become a star in pictures is to be born in the right family. For in Hollywood, in many cases, blood is thicker than talent. The end. <laughs> And now, an important personal message from Fred Allen. Ladies and gentlemen, they say every comedian wants to play Hamlet. But I don't. I don't want to participate in a tragedy, and neither do you. And yet, tragedy will confront all of us if we lose this war. We'll win, but it's going to take everything we've got in effort and sacrifice. We've all got to do our share. And here's the thing that we all can do. Buy war bonds or stamps. No matter what your income, set aside 10% every payday. One dollar out of every ten to help buy planes and guns and ships and food and the million things our fighting men need to win. It's the safest, wisest investment you can possibly make. Start putting 10% of your income into war bonds or stamps on your next payday. You will be buying freedom for yourself and all of the generations of Americans to come. Thank you. Next week, our guest will be Maurice Evans, famous Shakespearean actor, and the winner of the Technical College Competition at West Virginia University, Mary Eleanor Mulholland. Thank you, Jimmy. This is Fred Allen saying goodnight for Texaco dealers from coast to coast, reminding you that haste makes waste and speed waste tires. Drive under 40 and save rubber and drive into your Texaco dealers at any time to have your tires checked. Remember, you're welcome. Good night. Thank you.